one, you're on. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Baron Frank Avila, or Avi, as most folks call me. I'm from the Kingdom of Winter's Edge. And today we're going to be talking a little bit about artillery and amp card, or basically how you can shoot for the most damage humanly possible. We're going to be looking at science, history to start with. We'll be going over the amp card rules and some very common misconceptions with siege engines in them. And we'll be looking at the end at kind of an overview of how to build a very simple but very effective siege engine. Now, before we dive into the meat of the presentation, there are two notes on terminology that I need to make you aware of. The first is that I'm going to be saying artillery versus siege. The siege, the word siege in the amp guard rules is kind of poorly used, but whatever. Artillery, I'm going to be using specifically to refer to projectile engines, as opposed to siege towers, battering rams, portable walls. So when I say artillery, think anything larger than a bow and arrow or a crossbow that hurls a projectile downrange. That's it. The other terminology note is on the names of engines. One of the big things that you see when you start studying this is, this is a ballista, this is a scorpion, this is whatever. And that's a great way to tell that whoever's talking is only studying the surface level stuff. The term catapult, first of all, is, the, is generic for everything. But your particular names, they're a mess. And I'd love to blame this on Victorian era pseudo scholars, just like you can the problems with armor naming. But it goes back even further here. There's a medieval guy named Egidius Romanus who made up three different names for different types of engines, just made up fake Latin words and attributed the names to the ancient Romans. Problem is these words don't show up anywhere else in either ecclesiastical or classical Latin. They, these types of machines didn't exist in the ancient world and he just made stuff up. There's an older source than that where the opening sentence of the treatise uses three different words, three different names for the same machine. In that guy's defense, he's using it as a, the sentence is about, hey, these are all three different names for the same machine. There's another source which uses that some of the same names, but to a very, very different machine. So the thing, first remember, catapult refers to everything. If it uses anything other than an explosion to hurl its projectile, it's a catapult. A trebuchet is a catapult. An onager is a catapult, whatever. They're all catapults, it's a generic word. Second, you use a tr we use a descriptive taxonomy, meaning we name it based on how it works. So you'll hear me use the phrase two-armed torsion engine or one-armed torsion engine, meaning it's a, an engine that is powered by twisted ropes and it has one or two arms. Similarly, you'll hear me use counterweighted engine or traction engine. These are just a description of how the machine functions. That is your best naming scheme. Now, motive force. This is where stuff starts getting interesting. We've got pretty much the sky's the limit in amp card in terms of what you can use in the way of motive force. The only things we're prohibited from using are chemical explosive forces. In history, there are five or six commonly used types. Flexion, which is the exact same as, it's what powers your boat. That is flexion. Torsion is twisted ropes. If you, were, if you ever twisted yourself up and spun around on the swings as a kid, that untwisting, that desire of the bundle of ropes to go back to its straight state, that's torsion. That is the most common historical method in the time period I'm going to be focusing on. That's what I'll be covering at the end of the video. But 
And in my opinion, that's probably the best method of powering an engine in amp car, given, given what we shoot at. Traction shows up a little bit later in the West, shows about the same time as torsion in the East. And that, that's just humans pulling on ropes. <laughs> there are engines out there in, from the Chinese, <clears throat> from China, where you could have up to 200 men pulling on a whole bunch of ropes at the end to launch the projectile. This is the beginning of the trebuchet family of catapults, and they would be later wed to a large counterweight or heavy box for the next type. That counterweighted engine you raises a weight anywhere from a few pounds for a very small projectile like we'll use up to the order of several tons of weight. Those <clears throat> show up late period for us, but again, perfectly usable. The next one that you see commonly historically is chemical force. This is gunpowder. Later on, we'll use things like cordite or lidite, various forms of explosion. That is the only one of these that we can't use in amp guard, although there are still ways of sort of simulating it. Now, in the uncommon, most of these did actually appear historically, not necessarily in period, but they were, but they do show up. Pictured here is an extension spring catapult or extension spring trebuchet built by a guy named Kagan Shin out of, I believe, Rivermore. Wonderful gentleman. Where <clears throat> the way it works is the springs want to snap back to their shortened state as you pull or when you release the arm. Pulling the top, long end of the arm down extends the springs. When you release, they snap back, providing your motive force. You also see in period elliptical springs being used. These are pressed in and want to return to their uncompressed state. Compression springs similarly. We use occasionally pneumatic powered engines or compressed air. This actually shows up in the ancient world, although very, very rarely. There's a source from about 250 BC that details the construction of one. And they said, hey, this was a cool, tri cool triviality, but it doesn't work very well. You've got steam powered cannon late, as late as, or I'm sorry, as early as the 1500s. And they show up again, actually during the world wars for anti-aircraft purposes. And one that's really common in Amped Guard is elastic force. Think gigantic slingshot. You take surgical tubing or something similar that is stretchy on its own. You stretch it, you pull it back, load the projectile in, release. Giant water balloon launcher, basically. Actually shows up in World War One for historical use, but it's the most common intro-level artillery piece in Amp Guard. There are three historical periods of artillery. We've got, if, at least if we restrict ourselves to kind of the European area. When we branch out, this model doesn't hold as well, but we'll go ahead and keep this model. In the ancient, we've got the ancient world starting in 399 BC when Dionysus of Syracuse starts building his first, or Dionysus starts using his first pieces of artillery. And he employs them for the first time in 397 BC at the Battle of Motia in an anti or in a coastal defense role against the Syracuse, or sorry, against the Carthaginian Navy. During this period in time, we see flexion artillery developed, and we see torsion artillery come along about a century later. Next, you've got the medieval era. This begins slightly after the fall of the Western Roman Empire and goes until, until about 1600, 
when we see the final use in warfare of mechanical artillery. This is, this is your trebuchet fan, subfamily of catapults. Traction, counterweighting shows up much later than, than does counter traction. But this period is, this period is relatively brief in terms of its main use on the battlefield because it overlaps very heavily with the early modern era, beginning about 1300 with the introduction of gunpowder artillery. Chinese and Arabic sources give a slightly earlier date, but none of them give a hard and fast date. Our first, first confirmed use of chemical projectiles is somewhere in the early 1320s in England. And just kind of an aside, we may currently be at the dawn of a fourth era of artillery. Some of the experiments that are being done in energy-based weapons could be the start of that fourth era. We'll see. Now, focusing on the ancient world in Europe, as I said earlier, the Siege of Maatia is the first time that artillery is employed in a coastal defense role. At that point, it was flexion artillery or basically gigantic crossbows. The first engines were something called gastrophites, literally belly bow, because they were just large crossbows that needed, you needed to use the muscles in your stomach to, to be able to draw them. They introduced a sliding mechanism and that was what began to differentiate between personal weapons and artillery pieces. Now, flexion lasts as the main weapon for about 60 to 70 years. We're not completely sure on dating, but we know that torsion begins to appear during the time of Philip of Macedon and is really brought to the fore by his son, Alexander. Now, Again, torsion is the force of ropes being twisted up. Remember this because it is kind of the key to artillery in this time period. The reason why flexion or why flexion goes the way of the dodo is if you want to hurl a small five pound rock, you're going to need flexion arms that are about 18 feet long to either side of the bow or either side of the stock. That's not realistically buildable, at least in the ancient world. Today, maybe, but you're, you're kind of limited. With your torsion artillery, there are sources talking about up to almost 200 pound rocks being built. Now, these engines at this point in time were multiple stories tall and fixed in place, but they are all over Europe and the Mediterranean basin. These things are highly, highly sophisticated machines. The earliest known use of the cube root had been, we thought, something in like the second century AD. I actually sent in a correction to a math textbook on the topic because I found a reference to using the cube root in siege engine construction from the third century BC, almost 500 years earlier. That gives you an idea of just how sophisticated these things can be. Now, as time goes by, the Romans adopt what the Greeks had built. And for the first couple hundred years, the Romans stick with wooden machines just like the Greeks did. However, somewhere around 100 to 200 AD, they make a transition over to using iron framed engines as opposed to wooden framed engines. And while there are a whole bunch of Greek contributions, this is Rome's only big one. Now, this type of engine lasts until the middle of the sixth century. There may be a few, there may have been some surviving in Asia Minor in the Byzantine Empire until slightly later, but we know that by the, by the early medieval period, torsion engines had pretty much entirely disappeared. 
This is largely because of how complex they were mathematically. Things easy for us to do today with calculators, not so easy to do even just 50 years ago before the calculator became common. Uh, come on. Pictured here is a very weak drawing of a torsion engine. These things could actually shoot arrows, rocks, whatever. There's a really neat story from one of the Carthaginian Wars where Hannibal loaded, loaded his engines with pots filled with venomous snakes and hurled those at enemy ships. The resulting chaos resulted in an easy win for him. Here's a picture of an onager or a one-armed torsion engine. There's a lot of argument in the historical community about how these were constructed. This is, this is one common rendition of it. And we'll never really know because we don't have any good pictorial evidence. And this here is the frame of one of my engines, the warm kitty. Little ball of fur is under construction currently. But you'll notice the curvature on the back side of that frame, of that board. That is actually an evidence of the mathematics in this. By curving that board, you're able to move the holes backwards relative to your stop positions of the arms and actually increase your efficiency quite a good bit. Now, breaking out of Breaking out of the Mediterranean in Europe, we're going to pop over to China very briefly. The Chinese era of artillery begins at about the same point in time, somewhere in the late warring states period. And that, that's going to be around the late 300s BC, just like in Europe. We, this is actually notably absent. There is no mention at all of artillery in Sun Tzu's The Art of War. And while that's not, that is not evidence that it wasn't there, it's a pretty strong indicator. Now, the way Chinese, or the way Chinese warfare work was slightly different, different emphases culturally. So they, their artillery was not predominantly anti-personnel. They largely used things for knocking down walls. Traction engines can only hurl rocks or similarly shaped objects. These are machines that were intended to be crewed anywhere from half dozen people just pulling on the ropes at the end of the machine up to a couple hundred. This, this particular style of engine was the only thing commonly in use until gunpowder shows up and is replaced by, replaced by cannons, replaced by the Hawacha of Korea, and various other things. But traction engines were the, the main artillery in China from about 350 to 400 BC up until somewhere in the 1200s when cannon show up. So they skip what we think of as the ancient era in Europe, go straight to what Europe would consider the medieval era. And then move into the modern. Now, medieval era in Europe, we, we're going to split into two sections. First, we're going to look at a, the Avars and Byzantium. And that's when the traction engine begins to show up. We don't have an exact date on when it first appears. We know it's sometime in the 580s. Looking at the works of St. Demetrius, or on St. Demetrius, where we know it was carried west by migrating tribes, probably as a result of the Mongol, or I'm sorry, the Hunnish movements westward and all the people that they began to displace. The first recorded use is by the Avars sieging a Byzantine city in, in Western Greece. 
and it undergoes various evo minor evolutionary changes until the 11th century. You see different tower structures, you see different numbers of people being used to crew it. Nothing major though, until <clears throat> the end of the 11th century, Emperor Alexios decides to wed it to a counterweight and that moves us really into what we think of as the trebuchet today. These do show up in other treatises, but the two big historical medieval treatises from Byzant Byzantium, <coughs> that Byzantium, excuse me, they're barely mentioned. You'll go through, read these 200 page books and find five mentions, five lines referencing artillery. Artillery in the medieval world isn't a big deal until, until the Crusader era. And that will bring us to medieval history to Crusader Bugali. This is where artillery begins to show up on the battlefield in Europe again. Sometime around 1080, 1090, Alexios Komnenos, Emperor of Byzantium, puts a counterweight on a traction engine instead of the ropes. This gives us our first counterweighted trebuchet. These machines are incredibly powerful and very impressive to the Crusaders who first encountered them in 1096 during the Siege of Jerusalem. Or sorry, 1099 during the Siege of Jerusalem. The <clears throat> Crusaders adopt these things and go to town with them. You see something like 14 of them at one siege, or at the Siege of Jerusalem, at the Siege of Acre. 100 years later, they're all over the place. The Crusaders just absolutely love them. They take them back west. At some point, even 50 years later, there's an Arabic source that specifically refers to the Frankish style of trebuchet. And while it is referring to a traction engine, the fact that they're, they're having to list a different type as Frankish when they're already describing four different types tells you that there's a significant difference there. And these machines, they're, they're prolific, but they're not at the same time. When they go west, you may see two or three of them as opposed to seeing literally hundreds of, of, of engines in the ancient world. These things, the biggest that we have on, you know, I've, <laughs> I've forgotten what the siege was. I think it was Stirling Castle. But Edward I of England, the thing was multiple stories tall. But because these things are beginning to come into their own around the same time that gunpowder is becoming a big going concern, they don't last terribly long. The trebuchet, as, or the counterweight trebuchet, lasts as a primary weapon of war from about 1090 to a about 1350, so only a span of about 270 years. Not nearly enough time for them to be fully developed. And it's not actually until the last 20 to 30 years that we've really started doing anything significant with them in terms of mathematics and science. Just there wasn't a need. Gunpowder pushed them off the field. And that brings us to the early modern era, which is kind of the last thing that we're going to be covering in terms of history. This can be summed up in one word, cannon. Here you see one, of, one massive cannon being shown. Gunpowder is a Chinese invention, despite the myths, despite there being myths of it being invented by about seven different people in Europe at different points in time. And depending on whose book you read, there are all sorts of different dates when it can show up. There's one source that claims it was as early as 140 AD. There are other sources that claim it as late as 900. 
Short answer is we don't know. We know it was somewhere in that range. And it almost certainly was not applied to artillery pieces until late in the <clears throat> late in the period. Just like traction engines, these gunpowder makes its way west. And in the west is where it goes from being a curiosity and occasional weapon of war to being a the primary weapon of the field. The Arabs have possible references to cannon being used in the late 1200s. Again, we don't know. The first confirmed use is from 1327 in England. And the English are actually the ones to really, really begin to develop gunpowder. Everybody sees what they do with it in the Hundred Years' War, and they say, oh, wow, this is awesome. And within about 30 years of the start of the Hundred Years' War, everybody has adopted cannon. The siege trains of the 1400s were huge, and they're actually what shifted the emphasis, the emphasis in warfare away from the bow to artillery. And here we see a much smaller ship's cannon from about the same time period. This is probably a four pounder piece named for the weight of shot that it would throw. So probably about a two inch sphere of iron. Just a little pintle mount. Now we're going to move into amp guards siege rules. We're going to cover what the rules are. We're going to look at some very common misconceptions, some, some old ideas that have gotten pulled in from past editions that don't exist anymore. And we're going to look at how we can implement, I don't want to say exploit, but play with these rules. Now, first of all, there are actually very few rules on siege engines in the Amgard. There's almost nothing other than a, a couple of paragraphs on page 18 of the rules of play. There, there are no restrictions on what your type of motive force is other than you can't use chemical. Although people do simulate that with compressed air. There's some really neat stuff being done at Known World War and out of Rivermore and I think Polaris people are doing some stuff on this as well, but don't quote me on that. <clears throat> and other than that, all it has to do is mimic a historical or fantasy engine. And once you throw in fantasy, that gives you pretty much everything since World of Warcraft is fantasy. And that pulls in technology as far as, well, really some mix of diesel punk, steampunk, all sorts of stuff. Historical, you've really anything has been used in history at some point. If you can think of it, humans have used it. Even the elastic engines, the slingshots, show up in the trenches of World War I. Now, the damage is actually where you can get into some kind of neat stuff. There are two damage types that you can shoot for. If you shoot multiple projectiles at once, you're going to either deal a wound or deal armor breaking. And that's it. Very simple. If you shoot a single projectile at a time, you shoot for what is effectively an engulfing insta death. They're dead, their gear's broken, all of it, regardless of where it hits. Previously, it was described as wounds kill, everything breaking ignores armor. They took that language out in a recent change to the siege rules. And it's just an engulfing, you're dead, your gear's broken, rather than trying to do it by the damage types. Now, there are a couple of weird interactions here with Song of Deflection and Missile Block. Song of Deflection does not work against single shot siege projectiles. Just no effect you're from the song of deflection you're just as dead whereas protection from projectiles does actually keep you safe missile block similarly doesn't work against single shot but it does work against multi-shot engines and so there's some kind of odd things going on be sure if you're trying to use those abilities well double check double check what you're doing 
I once shot a poor, had a bard jump to try to catch a shot in the chest while using Song of Deflection and not realize the weird interaction was there. And he had to call dead, sadly, despite doing what he thought was a cool tactic. One kind of neat aside here is it's number of shots at a time, not number of, or not rapidity of shots. So I'm actually working on adapting a or an ancient engine from about 200 to 250 BC that has a chain drive and a magazine feed and my uh, my rate of fire with it is measured at about around every two to three seconds that's still because it's a single shot at a time the engulfing insta death assuming I get the machine parts to get everything work and not not chop every about fifth or sixth round now Whereas archery, you have to half draw within 20 feet. You just can't shoot at anyone within 20 feet, period, end of conversation. So you're going to have to learn how to judge 20 feet on the fly. That's a skill most amp guarders should be developing since 20 feet comes up a lot in casting anyway. But it's even more important for siege engineers. The one big hard and fast design requirement that we have in Amp Guard is your ammunition is regulated. We don't regulate the engines. We don't expect people to be mechanical engineers. We don't expect people to be mathematicians. We expect you to be able to make safe ammunition. Your ammunition has to be one of the four projectile types listed, light or heavy thrown, arrows or rocks. Contrary to popular belief, javelins are not permissible for siege ammunition under the current rule set. There are a whole bunch of people out there building javelin power or javelin based engines. Those engines aren't actually legal under the rules of play, but be careful. And the last kind of major rules misconception is there is no minimum crew requirement. In version seven and earlier, you were required to have three or more people actively crewing the machine and they couldn't be doing anything else. That got taken out in V8. You can soft kitty, the type of engine I'm going to be detailing the construction of here in a minute, can reasonably be crewed by a single person. Now it takes two or three to move it, and your operations go a lot more smoothly if you have two or three people helping load, but it can reasonably be worked by a single person. And lastly, <clears throat> siege engines have, are never impacted by melee. They are afflicted by weapon breaking, just like anything else. So arrows, spell balls, those will break a siege engine. Melee never does. The, <laughs> correction, never in-game breaks it. I've had somebody break one of my machines by running up and hitting it really hard with a pole arm. And I was very angry because it meant I had to spend about three or four hours when I got home from the event repairing the machine, fabricating new parts. But <clears throat> that wasn't an in-game break. That was, you physically broke my thing. That person... It was a sad day. Now, we're going to be going over how to build a two-armed torsion engine. I'm not going to be giving you the design diagrams here just because no one wants to look at my hand-drawn sketches. My handwriting is awful. My sketching is worse. But there are four main subcomponents of a two-armed torsion engine. The torsion frame, which we'll be going over last in this, is what does most of the work. It holds the springs. And those springs are what power the engine. The stock is just like the stock on a crossbow. It provides a place for the ammunition to rest. It was where most of your hardware that you as the wielder are going to interact with. And it's also going to make it easier to aim by a counter or providing some sort of counterweight to the fairly heavy torsion frame. Your torsion frame. Well, the torsion frame on Warm Kitty weighs almost 100 pounds. Trying to maneuver that 
on its own is rough. Trying to maneuver it at the end of a four foot lever, pretty easy to do. There's a, we think of it today as a pintle. The ancients called it a universal joint, same thing. And if you build it correctly, it, you can actually rotate your engine 360 degrees. You can elevate, depress to adjust your distance. You can aim one of these things if you're skilled quite precisely, quite easily. There's a tale from one of Caesar's sieges in Gaul of, an, of a siege engineer, of an artillerist pinging this one spot on the walls just over and over and over again as different Gauls would step out to hurl pitch onto advancing Roman infantry. So this one artillery piece just ping, dropped a, <clears throat> dropped a Gaul. The next Gaul would step out, ping, and just kept on doing it. And that's because of the universal joint and your ability to aim it precisely. And lastly, there's the base. What interfaces with the ground? You can use a tripod, you can use wheels, you can build one of the actual huge period ones, but those are a pain to move on the battlefield. All sorts of different options. I'm going to cover how to build a tripod here. If you're going with a heavier engine like Warm Kitty, you'll want to put it on wheels, but really it's, it's whatever you want to do with this. Now, what I've got pictured here is my first torsion engine, the Soft Kitty. You can see the tripod base, very simple. And the beauty of this is that it collapses for transport. Soft Kitty actually breaks down into small enough components that it, all of my weekend gear, ammunition for it, and could fit in the trunk of my Saturn L200 quite easily. I was able to fit all this and all sorts of other stuff, another person, anything I wanted, no problem really. Warm Kitty doesn't satisfy that requirement, but I, I bought a truck because of that. Now this is built out of a couple of lengths of two by four and some hinges with a top disc. You cut your two by four, or your legs to the same length, you miter one end, getting mitering it to the same angle. I use 30 degrees mostly because that's easy to do. You put hinges on it or hinges and then you put that hinge or attach those hinges to the bottom of a disc. Your disc can either be something custom made like currently I'm using a three layer or three plies of inch thick board that I've cut and rounded off. Originally, I was using chair blanks that you can get at Lowe's. They're about 10 bucks. And I found that those were good for about six to nine months before they would crack. So I would just carry two or three spare ones to events. No big deal. But replacing that part every six to nine months kind of got old. So I made something that won't wear out nearly as quickly by doing those three layers of hard wood. Now, the advantage of the chair blanks is they come, they're already circular. So they're actually really easy to use, throw the part together in about five minutes. All you have to do is you have to find the center to drill a hole through for a bolt to connect to the U-joint. And the way we find that center is through something called the theorem of Thales. You can either do like 17 bazillion measurements or you can do this quick, easy mathematical trick. Anytime you draw a right triangle or inscribe a right triangle on a circle, the hypotenuse of the right triangle, the longest side of the right triangle, is a diameter of the circle. If you draw two right triangles on your disc so that they have different, different long sides, different hypotenuse, where they intersect, that's the center of your circle. Easy. Takes about, takes about 30 seconds and a sheet of paper. That's it. All you got to do. Now, the U-joint is the part that connect, is that U-shaped piece connected to the disc and the stock. 
it, it's made from three little pieces of two by four. One runs horizontally, two run or two sit on the edge and are vertical. Because of how close the U-joint sits to the frame, you're going to need to, to curve the tops of the verticals. That gives you corner clearance. It makes it so that you can actually rotate the pieces. If you just leave them straight, you're going to have to move the frame further forward. That's going to impact the, the weight that's on the end of that lever, or that's going to impact the length of your lever. And since, since the force exerted by it is equal or is, a, is proportional to the length of the lever, it's going to make your life tougher. Just curve your risers. The way this interfaces, to, or the way this connects to the tripod, you drop a bolt through, stick two washers on the bolt after it passes through the U joint, set the, then put the bolt through the top of the tripod, screw it down. That's it. Those two washers will give you enough clearance on top of the disc that you have an almost frictionless environment to be able to rotate quite freely. This is probably the easiest part to do. And this is where the engine gets its collapsibility from. The way it connects to the stock, similarly, you just run a bolt through through the U-joint into the stock. Whereas I, I do recommend taking the one for the connects to the tripod out for storage. I don't recommend taking this one out for disassembly. It's a pain to put back in and you don't really gain that much in terms of space by separating the stock and the U-joint. A little bit, not a whole lot. It's not worth the hassle. One thing I have started doing on some of my later engines is introducing ball bearings to the U-joint. Again, you don't have to. I don't actually recommend it for a, someone who's starting out because it does add complexity in your construction. And one of the beauties of this particular style of machine here is that it can reasonably be built with a drill, a jigsaw, and a palm sander. Other power tools will make it easier but those three are all that you have to have. Now the stock is that long piece that sits between the U-shaped piece and the big box at the front. It's a length of, it's a length of four by four. It's about three to four feet long, depending on your machine design. And that's the main body of the stock. That's it. All, all it has to be is that, and you drill four holes through or through the end to connect to the frame. Now at the back on soft kitty, you see that big unstained piece of, of four by four. That's because my, that's where the trigger block sits. My first like five designs of a trigger didn't actually work. I threw this one together out of just scrap materials I had sitting in my shop and it worked. And, I've never felt the need to change it. It's ugly, but functional. That's where the trigger sits. It's the trigger is just two gate latches screwed to the face of that connected by a piece of dowel rod. Now I've done some experimentations with single gate latch triggers, double gate latch triggers like this. And yes, the double gate latch causes it to misfire occasionally if you don't pull the trigger smoothly. But the the draw weight, or sorry, the trigger pull weight is significantly reduced on a double double stage trigger like this. So, so easier to pull, swings and roundabouts, upsides and downsides to, to both parts or to both systems. Um, my lord. Uh, yes. I, I apologize for interrupting. We are right now at 11.55. Um, we will be having another uh, class coming in in about uh, between five and, I want to say about five to 10 minutes. To, they will probably pop in and just to listen.
but I want to uh, give you the heads up on that. Thank you. I will go ahead and move on to the, this just connects to the frame by four, or four carriage bolts. And if you drop them vertically, easy disassembly. It interferes slightly with your precision of aim. But if you run them horizontally through the stock, you're not going to be able to take the separate stock from the frame. You lose the ability to break it down nearly as small. Makes it tougher to transport. The torsion frame. This is the part that does the work. The two horizontal boards are called the hull carriers. There is a Greek word for them, and that Greek word has gotten anglicized, but no one uses it. The vertical supports, all, they're, all they do is they hold those boards apart to keep your springs, the coiled ropes in there, at the correct lengths. Use oak for these components. If you can do it out of metal, great. But if you're doing it out of wood, use oak. I cannot emphasize that strongly enough. If you do it out of pine, your machine will break. It will break and it will hurt somebody. Use oak. These machines, in just a light engine like Soft Kitty, there is about 2,000 pounds of crushing force inside of the created inside the frame. Only a very small percentage of that gets transferred to the arrow. But if you if you are not careful, the frame will break on. So again, use your stronger material. I reinforce my spring holes with steel and a little more safely. I put small carriage bolts through. That stops the rotation because the springs want to untwist. That prevents them from rotating past a certain point. Now, you can use pine for the arm stops and anything that limits rotation. But anything that is going to be under pressure from the springs needs to be your stronger material. Here again, we've got the machine from the side. Now, for your spring holes, two and a half inches diameter is ideal for amp guard. Get yourself a two and a half inch hole saw, boom, you're done. Just stick that, stick a hole saw on your drill. It takes about 10 minutes to drill out each hole, no big deal. Your torsion springs are made from paracord. Each one is going to, you're going to pack as much paracord into that vertical hole as you can. You're going to use somewhere between 200 and 250 feet. It varies a little bit, but since you can adjust your tension on the fly, you'll be able to balance it out as you go. The torsion levers, those pipes that you saw, those are just, those are six to eight inch, to eight inch long lengths of conduit pipe. Because they're hollow, you can stick a, a length of steel, a steel around in there, and you can adjust your power as you go. Drop it for the storage, up it to get more range, whatever. The arms, the ones you saw originally were rectangular in shape or in cross section. If you taper them from along the length of the arm, that will actually increase your efficiency and give you about a 30% increase in range. Get an oak baluster, that'll do it. The length of your arm, like any other lever, does impact your power. Easier to draw with a longer arm, less force exerted. Get a balance that's right for you. And lastly, use oak for the arms. Again, cannot emphasize use a Spend the extra money to get a material that will last and will be safe. Cool. And finally, that brings me to a list of recommended historical reading. The first thing I would suggest anybody read is Marsden's books, Greek and Roman Artillery. Historical development can be found in most libraries. Technical treatises is a little tougher to find. Worth the read. Okay. And Rob, Lord, we are, yes. we, are, we are actually at our our mark. Wonderful. This is this is my concluding point. So okay. 
Pangali's book, eh, it's okay. There's like one useful formula in it. I'd suggest reading my two books, Ancient Artillery of Salberg and Rudolf Schneider's The Artillery of the Middle Ages and Sir Osnog's Spruce Moose. Otherwise, that's it. If there are no questions. I would like to thank our uh, very well-versed instructor today. Uh, this was a ver very well done class. Um, I will be stopping the recording at this time. If you have any uh, further questions, please uh, do not hesitate to message him to ask. And of course the reading that he's listed here would be wonderful for anyone wishing to start in on siege engines. Again, uh, William, thank you for, uh, my Lord, thank you for coming out and helping us with uh, this, with your teaching today. Pleasure to be here. And as time, we will be stopping the recording.